Good evening, friends. Welcome to our next session of Visionary Conversations. My name is David Barnard. I'm the President and Vice Chancellor of the University of Manitoba and will be uh, moderating this evening. I want to thank the University of Manitoba Alumni Association for its partnership on this and all of our Visionary Conversations. And I'd like to acknowledge that we're in Treaty 1 territory and on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe people and the homeland of the Métis Nation. The university and the forks of this city sit at the crossroads of the Anishinaabe, Métis, Cree, Dakota, and Oji Cree nations. This is the second of our award-winning Visionary Conversation Series for 2012, uh, 2013. I thank you for uh, recovering from Thanksgiving and coming out tonight. This event's been successful thanks to the outstanding quality of our faculty and alumni who've been making presentations as well as, as to the enthusiastic participation and interest of those of you who come and I see quite a few regular attendees in the crowd tonight. Uh, if you want to follow tonight's conversation on Twitter, then use the hashtag PoundUMVisionary. I always wonder why I announce that to people who are actually in the room because you can get the, is the second-hand experience better than the first-hand experience? I don't, <laughs> don't know. I could see following it on Twitter if you weren't here, but anyway. Visionary Conversations brings together some of the leading minds at the University of Manitoba for a dialogue with the broader community. And this year, we're including distinguished alumni among those leading minds, recognizing both the success of our graduates and the breadth of their knowledge and expertise. I'm proud to say that tonight, two of our panelists are alumni. The University of Manitoba is the home of visionaries, trailblazers, innovators, pioneers, mavericks. Our theme tonight is innovation, the key to economic success. Innovation fuels our economy and is critical for industry and contributes to the socioeconomic and cultural development of Canada. Our expert panel will talk about how innovation secures our future. This topic is particularly appropriate. Two of our distinguished alumni won a coveted innovation award from the Ernest C. Manning Award Foundation today. Carrie Green and Jeff Giles are the founders of Wolf Tracks, which in the 1990s developed DDP micronutrients. Their company operates out of our smart park, and they're an important component of the University of Manitoba's commitment to foster innovation. The micronutrient system features a patented technology Green and Giles engineered, Dry Dispersible Power, or DDP. They formulated DDP to coat and stick to each and every granule of micronutrient fertilizer in a blend. This technology results in even blanket-like coverage of micronutrient across a field. So please join me in congratulating Carrie Green and Jeff Childs. The format uh, for tonight will be this. Each panelist will have uh, five to seven minutes to comment on the discussion theme. Uh, some of them will use some visual images that will be on the overhead screen to illustrate their points. And then we'll open the floor for comments and questions. There will be wireless microphones, and uh, one of my colleagues will bring a, uh, a microphone to you. Uh, if you indicate that you want to participate in the conversation, raise your hand and someone will, will find you. Uh, I'll moderate the discussion as we progress. Uh, we promised you we'd be done by 8.30, so just a few minutes before that, I'll invite Dr. Digbert Jayas, our Vice President of Research and International, to provide a short summation of some of the key points. So let me introduce our first speaker, Zhen Yu Wu. Dr. Wu joined the IH Asper School of Business as an Associate Professor in 2011. He's held the position of Canada Research Chair in Entrepreneurship and Innovation since 2012. Before coming here, uh, Zhen Yu served as an Associate Professor of Finance at the Center for Strategic Financial Management at the Edwards School of Business in Saskatchewan. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Zhen Yu Wu. Well, thank you very much. Um, so I can start uh, as, as uh, an academic person. So, oh, well, I guess I get to use this one too. Okay, here we go. So, Innovation is the engine of the economic growth. And it can create huge value for both the e economy and the society. So, so one of the questions is how to quantify or how to measure the value created by innovation so that we can start. One of the approaches 
is to look at the stock prices of listed companies and to, to, to measure the value created by innovation. There are two components in the stock price uh, of a firm. One is based on the accounting information about uh, earnings per share, and the other is the net present value of the growth opportunities through research and development, which means innovation. So let me give you two examples before we, we go forward. Apple versus Sharp. In the fiscal year of 2011, Apple had a net revenue $108 billion with net profits $26 billion, about 20%. Samsung, one of the major competitors of Apple, had a net revenue $220 billion with net profits $21 billion. We know that these two companies have devoted themselves to extremely innovative products. And we know that in this industry, innovation is the key and the main theme. So now let's take a look at uh, three Japanese companies which have been in trouble these, these days because they have been so far behind in this regard. Sony had a net loss of $2.7 billion in 2011. Sharp had a net loss of $3.8 billion. And Panasonic had a net loss of $10.2 billion. Stock prices can reflect the consequences of innovation clearly. In the past two years, I got the information from yahoo.ca. In the past two years, the stock price of Apple went up dramatically, but that of Sharp dropped significantly. So growing through innovation is the dream of shareholders and CEOs, for sure. But it faces both internal and external blocks and difficulties. So what is the reality internally? First, management team faces strong incentives to focus on short term. Because as long as the short term performance is great, they can get way better positions in the, in the external labor market. This is the so-called managerial myopia. Second, as what you can see here, managers do not know how to achieve breakthrough technologies and products. And third, organizational incentives encourage only incremental changes, but discourage risk-taking experimentations and huge change. So let me quote what Mr. Donna Rumsfeld said before regarding the uncertainty principle. As we know, there are no unknowns. We also know there are no unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know, but there are also unknown unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. <laughs> so in the business world, the no unknowns keep managers up during the day, and unknown unknowns keep them up at night. <laughs> so externally, innovation faces financing difficulties as well. I'm going to focus more on that financing part, and Jan is going to talk a little bit more about equity financing part. So first of all, you probably will love this picture. Bank is a fair weather friend. According to Robert Frost, an American Poet. A bank is a place where they lend you an umbrella in fair weather and ask for it back when it begins to rain. <laughs> so in the meantime, we have realized the importance of relationship financing when borrowing money for innovation. But keep in, keep in mind, bank is a fair weather friend. Financial institutions also tend to provide short-term financing for, for innovation. Therefore, firms will have to keep renewing the short-term financing as a fake long-term debt. That discourages small firms and new ventures to plan long-term. We are experiencing an economic downturn. The question is, do you believe this is a great time and opportunity 
for us to do something new in entrepreneurship and innovation. So we have seen people taking these opportunities in the past few years a lot because all other competitors were gone. There are a lot of great ideas, but capital is scarce. Let me give you some figures. So investment in startups fell about 33% in the last quarter of 2011 compared with that of 2010. Only six venture-backed companies were able to go public in the States last year. Only 260 venture-backed companies were acquired by large companies last year in the States. That was the first time since 2006 that the number had gone below 300. So before I give my mic back to uh, Dr. Berna, let me quote what Machiavelli said. He's, the, uh, he's one of the uh, Italian philosophers in 1400s and the author of The Prince. Never let a serious crisis go to waste. It's an opportunity to do things you couldn't do before. Machiavelli. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Zhenyu. Uh, second speaker tonight is James Blatz, who's Associate Vice President of Research for Partnerships at the University of Manitoba. Dr. Blatz uh, received his PhD in, in the year 2000 in civil engineering here at the University of Manitoba, and he completed an insert postdoctoral award at the Geoengineering Center at Queens and RMC after that. He has previously been the Associate Dean Research and Graduate Programs in the Faculty of Engineering. He's a professor in the Department of Civil Engineering conducting research in the areas of risk management for civil engineering infrastructure and technical aspects of temporary and permanent flood protect protection works. Please join me in welcoming Dr. James Blatz. Thank you very much, uh, President Barnard. And it's an absolute pleasure to be here this evening. And I'm going to have a very brief story that I'm going to tell you. And it's about a journey that I've taken through the time that I've spent as a member of the NSERC Council, which is a Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada. I started serving in 2008 uh, at a time when uh, the government was going through some reassessment of policy on innovation and partnership with uh, private sector and, and just looking at the innovation spectrum in Canada. And uh, it's, it was interesting to note that in their report, uh, it was uh, titled State of the Nation, they identified that the overall R&D expenditures in our country was in the OECD nations number 13 out of 30 which meant we were batting pretty much in the mid-range. We were doing our job, certainly, and that's total R&D expenditures, post-secondary, research centers, all the way through the spectrum to industry. But what they discovered when they broke that down was the more interesting element, and that is that on the investments by the federal government into the post-secondary system, we were punching way above our weight. We were number two in the OECD, OECD nations, only second to Sweden. But the corollary to that, obviously, is if on the overall we're halfway, is that the investments by the private sector in doing R&D for developing innovative products, efficiencies, and becoming more productive was lagging dramatically. And we're number 26 out of 30. And so from that, the Government of Canada asked NSERC, said, well, asked all the tri-councils for that matter, can you look at ways, how can we stimulate the private sector to get more involved in research and development, recognizing that the tri-councils are agencies established through acts that only give funding to post-secondary institutions. And so I had the great pleasure in the journey to be part of the Strategic Partnerships Initiative of NSERC, which looked at ways that post-secondary could help support and foster and stimulate research in the private sector to lead to economic development through increased productivity, obviously leading to further jobs, tax base, which obviously helps society through programs and social programming. And so it was very interesting as we started on that journey that we recognized right away one of the key elements was there was a complete disconnect. Well, complete's not fair. Obviously, there's a lot of great research going on with industry partners here at the University of Manitoba and at all of our colleges or at institutions across Canada. But the fact is we weren't doing enough. And I think that's the challenge that I've been thrown, and I'm absolutely thrilled to have been uh, appointed to this position as Associate Vice President of Partnerships because my boss, the, the Vice President, is very much all about partnerships. Uh, being a distinguished professor who's worked in grain storage uh, systems and has been recognized through uh, all of the efforts and how it's actually contributed to societal benefit in those areas of the world where grain storage is absolutely critical, 
He recognizes, and basically through, through my interest, we share the, uh, well, the desire to really inspire others to do more partnership work. And so the way that we're looking forward in that is how can we then use our basic science understanding, use our fa faculty members that understand fundamental research to get more engaged in the private sector. And this is where the tri councils recognize an opportunity. And through a series of programs have now created the opportunity for private sector partners to access funds that can be used to stimulate research at post-secondary institutions. And so now, now really the conversation is about balance. How can we take this incredible capacity of fundamental researchers and help guide them to communicate with uh, our business leaders in the private sector community and how can we get them engaged to say we can support your research needs if we work together and through some of these programs access the funds that are available. So I think really the critical element of looking at this is identifying how can the university play a greater role in those private sector partnerships, how can we build that bridge to communicate the same language so that when the academic community is looking at opportunities to support private enterprise, they see those opportunities for more graduate students, which is part of the critical element of our role. They see more opportunities for publications and dissemination of knowledge. But at the same time, they respect the importance of return on investment and ensuring that cash flow is, is obviously protected and ensuring that at the end of the research spectrum with a private sector partnership, we're actually leading to a product or leading to a process or leading to an efficiency that allows them to move forward to create a larger enterprise that employs more people and creates more opportunities for society. So I think that's really the role now is defining where can we shift that balance and how can we better engage our research community to support that private sector enterprise. And so ultimately, I think that's the question that I want to pose is where is that balance and how can we better shift so that our R&D investments as a nation are more on par with what our OECD, uh, other OECD nations are showing and how can we use the research capacity at the university to better serve development, uh, economic development here in the province. Thank you. Thank you, James. So I'm pleased that uh, Ms. Janice Letterman, a graduate of this university and currently chair of its Board of Governors, has agreed to be a member of our distinguished panel tonight. Uh, in addition to serving as a strong leader of our university community, Jan has extensive experience in business law with an emphasis on trade, finance, and business transactions. She was named to the 2012 edition of Best Lawyers in Canada in Mergers and Acquisitions Law and has provided advice to entrepreneurs, closely held corporates, and partnerships, governments, universities, and crown corporations. Jan is also executive chair of the Manitoba Innovation Council, president of Innovate Manitoba, and a partner at Thompson, Dorfman, Swedman. Please welcome Janice Letterman. Thank you, David. So I'm going to come at this from a little bit of a community perspective. In 2007, a group of Manitobans consisting of representatives from business, government, and academia went to Scandinavia to study why it was that the Scandinavians seemed to be having such success at making their relatively small economies so competitive. This group of citizens knew that in order for a small population province like Manitoba to grow and to thrive, we were going to have to collectively develop strategies to get all of our working parts working together on the right agenda in an effective and efficient way. We were going to have to become more innovative. Perhaps not surprisingly, it wasn't clear uh, in back in 2008 what the strategy should be. And there wasn't a very good understanding of what innovation was, let alone a collective agenda for addressing the challenge. Since that time, the term innovation has become ubiquitous. Many studies have been commissioned and reports issued in North America and elsewhere on what jurisdictions need to do to transform themselves to meet the challenges of the so-called new economy, in short, to become more innovative. We typically think of innovation as invention. Invention, the generation of the breakthrough idea, is a big part of innovation, but innovation means more than just invention. To paraphrase the report of the Canadian Council of, of Academies, innovation is the design, development, or implementation of something new in a way that provides value to the customer and generates a return for the organization providing it. In his work, Clayton Christensen has shown us that innovation can be a disruptive game changer, like the printing press, the automobile, or the microchip. 
or it can be an incremental or sustaining innovation that makes something bigger, better, or more valuable, such as planes that fly further, computers that process faster, or cell phone batteries that last longer. The adoption of new or better ways of doing something is the most common form of business innovation. All of these things have links back to the generation of new or novel ideas. But the process of executing on those ideas, of turning a prototype into a market-ready product or a few customers into a growing business, is commercialization. There's a commercialization value chain that moves from idea to product to market to satisfied customer to viable business. Innovation can be achieved at all stages of the value chain. It's a process which requires skill sets different from the skill sets required for idea generation. It can involve design, engineering, production planning, research and development, and financial and legal analysis. It requires business discipline. Innovate Manitoba works primarily in three areas. To simplify and accelerate the commercial of innovation in Manitoba, to support entrepreneurs and build next generation startups, and to pr improve access to capital for Manitoba's emerging and expanding high growth companies. So I want to use my last couple of minutes to pose a couple of questions in each of these areas. The first is whether our post-secondary health and research institutions are doing enough to translate the, the investment that society makes into research into something that has broader societal value. Clearly there's significant and critical place in society for pure research. As a result, there's lots of academic research that has little potential for commercial uh, realization. But too often, research discoveries with commercial potential become part of scientific knowledge without realizing their full impact on society. The second question is, do we really have a shortage of venture capital in Manitoba? The statement that we do have a shortage seems to be accepted across the board as a truism that has taken on mythic proportions. I sometimes get the sense that many people believe the lack of access to venture capital is all that stands between us and economic success. I wish it were that simple. Research conducted by Innovate Manitoba shows that generally there's not a shortage of venture capital investment in Manitoba for large mid to later stage growth companies. VCs are investing in Manitoba, but they're investing relatively large amounts in relatively large companies, which is exactly what VCs do. The shortage of risk capital is more of an early stage problem in Manitoba and el elsewhere. With a few exceptions, VCs simply do not invest in early stage companies. From my perspective, the immediate challenge we have in Manitoba is not so much a shortage of venture capital investors, but a shortage of angel investors, which is a local problem because angel investors tend to invest locally. In the last decade, angel investors have filled the funding gaps left by VCs as VCs move upstream to invest in less risky, more mature ventures. Angel investors have become the new early stage venture capitalists. US research estimates that angel investors now provide up to 86% of the seed and early stage capital available to start up ventures. The third question I want to ask is, are we lacking a culture of entrepreneurship in Manitoba? Or to put it a little differently, do we really have enough ventures in Manitoba that would be attractive to angel and VC investors? I personally think that we do, but it's not without challenges, and there's certainly room for improvement. Angel investors, let alone VCs, have to invest in firms with high growth potential in order to have the chance of earning the kind of returns needed to support their risk taking. It's well known that in a typical venture portfolio, risk equity investors tend to lose or break even on eight out of 10 of their investments, with only two investments earning the kind of returns necessary to generate the reward that uh, is sufficient for their risk taking. Research in the US and the UK shows that the vast majority of small businesses, up to 90%, are so-called lifestyle businesses. And that's not intended to be pejorative. They can be stable businesses and they create employment. But generally, they tend to support low paying jobs with few benefits and are not capable of generating the kind of returns needed by angel investor and VC investors. And that's not to criticize that type of firm, but when people say that access to risk equity capital by VCs and angels is what we're missing, I think there's a real challenge to be put as to whether we have enough companies with high growth returns that would be attracted, attractive to that type of investor. 
The most important small businesses from an economic development perspective, the job creation perspective, and the kind of businesses that angels and VCs exclusively seek are rapid growth businesses, so-called gazelles, that make up only four to eight percent of all small businesses, but account for 70 to 75 percent of net new jobs. In Canada, that number is an undoubtedly lower. That's research uh, in the last couple of years from the US and the UK. But in Canada, if we're able to increase the number of successful high growth ventures in Manitoba, for example, from 4% to 6% or even 8%, then we will be growing the pipeline of businesses that are attractive to venture investors and potentially having an impact on the number of jobs being created. In Manitoba, as in Canada, if your ambition is to be a high growth venture, you will have to develop global markets for your business, as you won't find the sales to drive high growth uh, at home. Many Manitoba businesses do not export out of the provinces, and of those who do, I'm told that close to 70% of those exports are to other provinces in Canada. We need to develop a generation of Manitoba entrepreneurs with a mindset oriented towards growing and competing on the world stage. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. Our final panelist this evening is Dr. Jerry Price, who was born here in Winnipeg, has bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees in mechanical engineering and applied mechanics. Following graduate studies, Jerry worked as a defense scientific services officer for the Defense Research Board in Alberta, then joined E.H. Price Limited, now Price Industries Limited, in 1977. In 1986, he became president of Price Industries following its startup in Asia Pacific and began to lay the foundation for expansion into the U.S. market. During his tenure, he has launched many new product lines, factory expansions, and new business units in Canada and the U.S. In addition to his business success, Jerry is a member of many community and professional associations. He also sits on the boards of many foundations and participates in numerous capital and fundraising campaigns to support local philanthropic endeavors. In September, the Alumni Association of this university uh, gave Jerry the Distinguished Alumni Award at Homecoming 2012. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jerry Price. Just keep an eye on the time here. There's the clock. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here. And uh, what I'm going to do on my two cents on innovation is to speak to an industrial perspective um, and help you understand a few things about maybe our reality, because I can only speak to our experience. I'm going to start with the economy we're in and what it means for our business. Uh, the importance of the U.S., which we, as David mentioned, we started about 20 years ago. And then uh, talk to the factors that have uh, permitted us, or let's say enabled our success in both good times and bad, because we've managed to grow our business through good and bad times. Not hard in good times, because raising water raises all ships. But in bad times, that's the issue. How can you grow your business in the worst of times? And then I'll do some comparatives between Canada and the States relating to competitiveness, productivity, and a few things that are relevant on the innovation subject. So first of all, on the economy, while well, it couldn't be any worse than it is. In a nutshell, uh, you know, the Wizard of Id had a cartoon in the early 90s, he's, and it has a prisoner with a ball around his foot, and it says, uh, victim of the, and it was originally uh, recession, and then they crossed it out and said recovery. So that was the victim of the recovery. Well, we don't have a recovery in the current recession. This is the great recession. We've had four years of declining market opportunity in our market, which is non-residential construction. We're in the fifth year of the recession, and it hasn't stopped declining. I've been through four uh, slowdowns or recessions in my career. Early 80s was the interest rate issue, which we solved, and I just can say solve, we survived. In the early 90s, uh, Canada lost two-thirds of its non-residential construction market, so we survived that crash. In the early 2000s, the dot-com bubble burst and impacted our business, and now the mother of all recessions has hit, which is really more of a depression than a recession. To put it in perspective, the old 50-year low in non-residential construction in the U.S. was 1958, with a construction level in the U.S. of 670 million square feet a year. And today, in 2012, we're running 15% below the 50-year low. We're now at 
570 million square feet, 15% below the old 50-year low. We're at the levels of the Second World War in terms of construction, and, the, and we are about as low as you can imagine it being. We've lost two-thirds of our market in approximately four years, and we're trying to keep the business alive in that depressed economy. So that's the reality of the market. It's not a great story. The U.S., on the other hand, has been a great story for us. We went down to the States 20 years ago with no employees, no brand awareness, no market penetration, and starting from scratch, we grew a business which today has a 41% share of the U.S. market, about 1,000 employees in the U.S. operating out of three plants, and, um, and we're dominating and climbing rapidly still. In spite of the ups and downs of the market, we've been able to grow a presence in a commodity business which had 10 established players when we went into the business, and now we are the market leader, and they're trying to chase us. So, so that's good. So why have we succeeded in the U.S. through the worst of times, and what has set us apart? Innovation is one factor, but it isn't the factor. It's one of several factors. Uh, the first factor in our success is our vision and values, which is a service vision. We serve our customers, I serve all our employees, and our employees and I, and us, we consistently serve the customer relentlessly. We don't keep score. We just give. We don't take. And it doesn't matter what it costs. We take care of the customer. That's fairly unique in business. There's a lot of people who give lip service to it and very few deliver. Second key element is innovation, which is one of the many elements that's key. And in that aspect, we innovate in multiple areas of the business. On the shop floor, we lean manufacturing and all the innovative things. Our software aids on the shop floor where we've created innovative factory software techniques. Uh, we innovate in our marketing centers in the way we present our product to the customer base with our price technical center in Atlanta. We innovate in R&D with Price Research Center North where we have nine labs here in Winnipeg and 65 people developing product full time. And we roll out between 30 and 50 new models a year and our catalog grows by 250 pages a year, and now our catalog's at 2,800 pages and growing. So the product development side is we're a relentless commercializer of what we invent. We also innovate in how we do R&D because we're a high-speed R&D machine. We innovate faster than any of our competitors, and in the case of European technology, we brought European technology to our North American market and in roughly three years, we created what our European competitors took nearly 20 years to create, and we launched a full rollout. So it's not just the product we do, it's the pace at which we produce product. So, so, uh, so that's the innovation element, which is one of the key thi things. But I think that one of the essential elements which is not being mentioned today and is key is uh, risk uh, appetite appetite for taking a chance, appetite for going into new territories, appetite for, um, you know, attacking something brand new and dominating, and mastering and then dominating. It, Canadians are prim primarily risk adverse. Americans are much more comfortable with, with risk taking. We as a company, I think, are more American by nature, and we're comfortable with risk. And that doesn't mean we're foolhardy, it's just that we enjoy the view from the front window of the car not the view of the rear view mirror which tells us where we were. It's much more exciting to have paths to choose compared to just stick to where you were. So, but going along with risk taking comes the launch of new business units and being an incubator as a company. And that's, that speaks to whether you're a builder or not. Are you a builder? Are you trying to create a legacy? Or are you trying to milk the cow and live a good life? We are builders in our company. We don't milk our cow, we just grow a big fat cow and keep growing it and growing it and growing it. And sooner or later, somebody will probably milk it, but it's a very happy cow. And so we launch many new products continuously. We incubate and, and uh, nurture and water and groom and, and support. And we have right now in our company 15 little business units that are being incubated. We haven't milked any cows. All the income stays in the business. And that's another exception too, which is key. <laughs> and you talk about access to capital, there is no capital for risk. Banks are absolutely risk adverse. They are your fair weather friend. Venture capitalists bet in on sure things. They don't bet on uncertain things. So 100% of our earnings go into innovation investment. In other words, we risk the earnings of the company 
100% and pile it all back into the business. So that means we tolerate low returns because after you spend all that you earn on, on incubating, there's no bottom line left. I mean, there's a very small bottom line left. So are there entrepreneurs out there who are prepared to take the long view and pile the investment in continuously, meaning all the free cash flow of the business piles back in and you create new business units and you nurture and nurture? Or are you there to feather the nest of the owner who wants a good life in 17 cars like Jay Leno and uh, whatever else, you know? And uh, so it takes, there's, I think it's a rare entrepreneur who isn't in it just for himself. And if you are in it for the greater good, if you're interested in legacy, if you're there as a builder, you will take the approach of spending your own money, your returns, on incubating and growing your business. That's a very key point. So as important as innovation, the motivation of the owner is really key. And the final element here in the essential ingredients for success is perseverance. Are you prepared to grind it out? Are you a company of grinders or do you want the quick score? We take the long view. We really don't care how long it takes. We just want to make steady progress. It's kind of my engineering training. It's all about trend. If you're starting to, if you see the trend is favorable, sooner or later you'll come out of the water and you'll be in the black. So as long as you're satisfied that you're moving in the right direction, you're making the, same, the incremental gains you need every year, fine, stay the course. If not, you know, we make sure the trend is good and then last it out. Don't quit, sooner or later you'll win. So that's our approach. Innovation is one element. It's, not an, it's, a, it's one of many elements that it takes to grow in uncertain times. The last comment I want to make is the difference between Canada and the States. And um, number one, our Canadian uh, investment sites are fundamentally uncompetitive compared to comparables in the US. And I can cite examples all across lots of locations. We have plants north of the border, we have plants south of the border. And on average, our material cost of sale and overhead items are 10% less for every category of expense in our US plants compared to our Canadian comparable plants. On top of that, our lowest wage plants are by far the states, and the wage differential is 100% in the case of some plants. Our Winnipeg plant fully burdened wage is double <coughs> the fully burdened wage of our Phoenix, Arizona plant. Now you want to ask yourself, can you, be can you be viable in a commodity world with double the wage cost in Canada compared to the states? And the answer is no. So we must be realistic of what you can do in Canada, and what you can do in Canada is not build commodities, but build niche products, because you'll, you'll blow your brains out in commodity manufacturing, and you might as well accept that. So create a business model that involves niche products, and you probably have a shot. Second is the productivity issue, which is so fundamental. America is by far the most um, exciting and, uh, and, and market of opportunity of any world market today. It, uh, the U.S. economy is 30% of the world GDP, to give you a, a single statistic. Believe it or not, 40 years ago, it was 30% of the world GDP. We've gone through 40 years of the U.S. holding its own as representing 40% of the world GDP. Now you look at other countries, the European countries, the E15, were 30% of world markets 40 years ago. They've declined to 22% and they're on a declining trend. Now you look at Asia, excluding Japan, they started off 40 years ago at 2.5% and now they're at 10% and climbing but sputtering. So I say to all you, if you're interested in growing your business, you don't have to look very far, look south of the border. It's the biggest, most exciting, open for business, free market in the world, and it's tremendously exciting. And America grooms and grows entrepreneurs. They practice kind of creative destruction where they take a good crisis and they exploit the crisis, just like the quote. And, um, and by creative destruction, I mean through uh, recessions, they, they, they spawn entrepreneurs, they spawn new businesses, and they have more growing uh, massive young businesses than the rest of the world. So I think if we want to look for models that work, look to the States. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jerry, and thanks to all of our panelists.
So a lot has been said, and I'm sure that, uh, that there are comments and questions uh, from those of you in the audience, as I mentioned before. If you have uh, something to say or something to ask, please raise your hand, and one of my, uh, one of my colleagues uh, will come to you. And don't hold back. Let's get the conversation started. Good here. I, I just have a question for the uh, second speaker, Mr. Blades. The, the question is, you, keep, you referred to private sector funds in the private sector. Does that, in, in your interpretation, does that include Crown Corporations? Uh, well, yes, it's, it's any, um, I believe by the definition, it would include Crown Corporations, not government agencies, but Crowns, yes. And that, that is total investment dollars by that private sector, including the Crowns, in R&D, per capita, that's what the measure was, and that's where we're really quite weak. I, I wanted to ask Janice uh, what she thought about the role of government uh, in Manitoba as a, as a financier for a very small business. And I guess that there's a hook in that because Crocus uh, ventured uh, in a number of different categories but what do you think? Does government uh, need to come back in? <coughs> and uh, thank you. I, I definitely think there's a role for, uh, for government. Um, the labor-sponsored venture capital funds were an experiment that, that uh, took place across Canada. And uh, over time, they proved not to be that successful. If you look to, for example, Israel, uh, which has the largest number of startup can uh, con uh, companies in the world, uh, the largest number of VC investments and outside of the US, the largest number of companies on the NASDAQ exchange. The government there plays a really important role in investing where the venture capital and the private equity players don't invest. So they invest at the very early stage uh, by giving grants uh, that are repayable um, if the company is, goes on to be successful. And they have a program for doing that. So, and, and that's been very, very successful, and the government's been very happy with their program. I think there's definitely a role for government in that area. In Manitoba, they have the Commercialization Support for Business Program, um, I, which supports early stage companies across the, the continuum of their, their needs up to uh, growth, including, I guess, the large industrial uh, loans. Um, it, uh, the new money in that fund probably isn't ac adequate. Uh, and I, I think people would like to see more and it easier to access uh, because that's been in a bit of an impediment, but, uh, but it is definitely a role. Ganpat Luda. I guess my question is to a couple of speakers here. The question is fairly simple. In the last 10 to 15 years, Chinese commodity market has, is controlling the world. And to what extent the last four years or last five years of economic crisis in the Western world is generated by the loss of the commodity market to Chinese uh, business? I guess, I guess, I uh, guess there are two sides of, uh, of I guess, of my answer to, to that question. Though, it's true that um, I, I guess in the past two three years, the commodity mar market in in China or Great China area uh, has been has been dropping, but it seems that the market base is still actually quite big. So that one, as long as the the companies would go to that market. Would be would be able to uh, boost the growth of the uh, or the growth potential of the of the businesses. But uh, another the other side of the answer is this. According to what Jerry just mentioned, is that does that mean that the trend is going to continue? If that trend is going to continue, that will hurt the uh, growth potential of most of the uh, businesses. We that will be running in in that area. That would be another issue. Uh, people would have to consider, I guess. Um, 
a couple of the speakers talked about the entrepreneurship the differences between Canada and the U.S. And I, I've worked in industry a number of years, and we seem to have a branch plant mentality where we're willing to work for somebody and make them rich, but we're not willing to take the risk and start our own companies. I, is this part of the Canadian culture, or is it because of the social safety nets, or w whatever the cause? How do we change that to get more people to innovate, start their own companies, and take on the more entrepreneurial role? I guess the question's for anybody on the panel. Well, I guess I'll answer a little bit of that. At Innovate Manitoba, that's one of the things, <coughs> one of the areas that we're focusing on is trying to encourage entrepreneurship and promote the creation of startups. And over the last couple of years in Winnipeg, um, I think the the culture for that is uh, is improving. There's lots of groups. I see uh, guys here from Ramp Up Manitoba, which was uh, we we held a startup uh, Canada week <coughs> this year, and and Ramp Up Manitoba got launched there. Um, of entrepreneurs coming together to build tech companies. They've held a couple of startup weekends. Um, there's some business incubators uh, operating uh, that really help entrepreneurship uh, entrepreneurs uh, learn and grow. Uh, we're running a venture challenge. We had 22 companies participate in the venture challenge this year. Of our winners, our first, second, and third place uh, winners, they got trips to the Banff Venture Forum, which was last <coughs> week. And uh, two of the companies pitched at the Banff Venture Forum and are currently negotiating investment deals uh, that I think they likely will, will close in the next short while. So, uh, you know, I, I see a, a real uptick in the, in the interest and the enthusiasm. And there are lots of groups doing things to try and, and uh, help entrepreneurs along. Can I add a bit? So, so, so an another, another uh, point I can add to uh, what Jen just mentioned is if you look at what Industry Canada and Statistics Canada uh, reported in the past <laughs> few years, over 90% of the companies were actually small ones. But I agree with Jen, a lot of them are actually lifestyle companies. Having said that, it doesn't mean that this is, this is just the, the, the nature of, of being risk averse. Actually, we have seen a lot of great companies with a lot of growth potential in, in, in the Canadian society and Canadian economy. By saying that, what I'm trying to, to make the point is that uh, some more support is indeed needed, but the entrepreneurs will have to be ready before they go to find the money. If you look at the, uh, the venture board in Calgary, running in Calgary, uh, we actually have a great program in the whole world, which is called CPC, the Canada Pool Company. That is actually a new way, a new approach which has been regulated so well to make sure that small companies and new interests can be, can be uh, well supported. I don't know how many people are aware of it. Even. Well, just to give a, a plug, on November 22nd, we're bringing in the Toronto Stock Exchange and the Venture Exchange to talk about using the Venture Exchange and the CPCs as a form of raising growth capital. One point that uh, we never talk about, but it speaks to um, having a culture of people, of people who are a little bit uh, comfortable with risk. It relates to just kids in school and our whole school system where th the issue of evaluation is kind of questionable. You don't really put kids through the trauma of being graded very often now. And, um, and we uh, protect our kids with this envelope that uh, takes away the risks of life. So we're grooming an, uh, a generation of kids who haven't ever explored in the forest and fallen and scraped their knee and taken a chance. They're, they're monitored and supervised and overparented, and um, you're creating a culture of people that are thin-skinned compared to thick-skinned. And the entrepreneurs who uh, prevail are thick-skinned. They go through bruises and bumps and grinds of life and they hit the workforce uh, comfortable surviving on their own and dealing with things through their own initiative. Uh, and also, from a schooling point of view, there's a prevalent, it's particularly in Manitoba, attitude that business is bad, business is self-serving, and um, as compared to in countries like Singapore, where I lived, uh, the prevailing view is that successful nations are built on the backs of successful businesses and business is elevated and in fact is nurtured and treasured 
and rewarded. And even in the States, it's far more that way than it is in Canada. So if you want to get a nation of entrepreneurs, uh, take a close look at your school system and the, the attitudes of the teachers and the, in that level and, and rethink that whole process. Because entrepreneurs are scarce today in Canada, but they're much, much more prevalent in the U.S. and in other world societies, just as a thought. <laughs> yeah. James. Yeah, I was, and I was just going to follow up on, on a similar line, but I think it even extends beyond that now that in the, in the post-secondary system, we are not stimulating entrepreneurship in all of our students, not just in Asper, where we obviously have a, a large focus on that, but there are entrepreneurial students everywhere, but we're not stimulating them, quite frankly. And, and they're being brought through the school system that is creating this sense of risk aversity. And oftentimes, we'll see them, and I, knew, I know my own faculty, looking for positions that have long-term pensions and these types of things, which, and, you know, public sector jobs, where they can move up the ranks and be very safe. And uh, there's no shame in that, but at the same time, if everybody's seeking that, the incredible irony is it's the private investors, it's the people building the companies that are creating the private wealth that are funding the public system that is creating those pensions. And so this imbalance is, causing, is going to cause a huge problem because when the private sector starts to look at this and realizes the wealth creation that is generating the public funds, the tax base that is creating those, those uh, pensions and that is, is starting to outweigh what they're receiving, it's, it's going to be uh, an interesting discussion. One more comment on that. Um, it's interesting when I listen to groups of investors and companies in which they've invested talk about these kind of things and, you, and there are American companies and investors involved, they always talk, a, a, a company will say, well, you know, I started out in business here and this failed and I learned this. It, it's, um, it's almost a, accepted as a rite of passage that, that, that you, you, if you start a business, it may well fail, and what did you learn? It's not the end of the, the story for you. Whereas in Canada, if you, it seems that if you start a business and fail, um, you're not quite a pariah, but, uh, but that's not an acceptable outcome. Right, right in front of you. Okay. I mean, I agree with what you people are saying, because the attitude of the students that I'm dealing with, they want a comfortable life, they want things laid out, and if I walk into a classroom and I say, look, as soon as I say something you disagree with, jump up and show me why I'm, why I'm wrong. That's your job. And they keep saying, we want you to have the answers. And I keep saying, no, I don't listen to burning bushes. You know, I don't have stones coming down with inscriptions. I'm wrong most of the time. But I'm willing to be wrong in public and for you to show me where I'm wrong. And they say, no, we want it to be comfortable, laid out clearly. You do the thinking for us. And I think, that, I don't know how we got students to be that laid back, that uh, reliant, you know, reading Mao's little red book and having no idea what they just said. Well, I think we, I, can I answer that? Yeah. Sure. I think we've created our own monster by, uh, by uh, putting a high premium on safety and a very low premium on either a risk or being evaluated or getting your knees scraped or whatever else, you know. And in societies where they have evaluation and there is a ranking and when you hit the world you win or lose and if you lose you lose, if you win you win. And even in, in uh, sports, like it's, it was so funny in Meet the Fockers when uh, he goes home and his mom's got 27 participation ribbons on the mantle of all the things he participated in life and he never had a, either a win or a third or a tenth in anything but he's a champion because he feels good and was it did it feel good you're my champion you know what I mean <laughs> like if we we have built a society of kids and young adults groomed in this Canadian safety net where you expect the government to have a silver pill or magic bullet to solve every one of your problems and we better change or our nation's going to fail. Because other nations don't have that and they are beating us up. America is beating us up. I'll tell you one thing I noticed with our U.S. plants. If you're unemployed in a given area in the States, what do you do? You pack your bags and you find a job somewhere in the country. What do you do in Canada? You write to your MP and say, I want a make work program in my city because I'm not moving. So in America, they migrate to where the jobs are in Canada. 
With our safety net, we just expect the government to, if there's no fish in Nova Scotia, no worries. You'll get a fish uh, dividend as if you were a fisherman and you can stay there because your grandfather was there, so you have the right to be a fisherman, even though there's no fish, you know? Uh, same with farming. If you don't farm, you get a fish dividend, a farming dividend, because your fa farmers w were in your family. So our, our country needs a wake-up call, and uh, we need to align with other countries that don't do that. So James and then uh, Jan, and then we'll move on. Yeah, no, I was just going to quickly say that, that this myth of uh, exploding self-esteem that we're creating in young people, it, it gets to the point when they finally do fail, it's so devastating. And that message just spreads out so far that, that they're absolutely scared to take risks in anything in life. And so they're looking for the participation medals and that's, that's, they're happy when they get them. Yeah, I, I was just going to comment that in the Scandinavian countries uh, where uh, the government plays uh, an important role in, in, in incenting uh, innovation and more importantly the commercialization of academic research, they've been very successful in, uh, in their outputs in terms of uh, creation of companies and new technologies and that kind of thing. So I think there definitely is a role for, for uh, government to play, but uh, you have to have the entrepreneurship culture to make that work. Behind you. Thank you. Um, I just, well, I'm a bit conflicted, I guess, as I hear the comments about our youth because um, there is a school of thought out there that feels that it's the curriculum in the school that's broken and that our children are bored to death because they have access to so much technology and so many um, alternative innovations, and yet they walk into a school that has a curriculum that was based on agrarian cultures some hundred years ago and that there isn't enough creativity being um, uh, encouraged in the school. And I wonder, I guess, to what extent um, universities have responsibility to provide the leadership to develop new curriculum and to new ways of learning and engaging our youth so that they're not bored in school and so that they are innovating. And I think it's more than entrepreneurship when we talk about economic wealth of our, com our, of our country. It's about social innovation. It's about innovation in our universities. It's about innovation in the way we deliver our government services. It's about adoption of new technologies. It's about solving problems every day because the challenge we face uh, hit us so much more rapidly than perhaps they had in the past or the impact is um, much more prevalent and, and faster. And so it's important, I think, that we all learn more skills around innovation and creativity and problem solving. So I, I appreciate what you're saying about our youth, and, but what causes that? You know, why aren't our children excited about learning and innovating and trying new things? And, I, I, I'm just wondering what you think in terms of the role of a university and, and leadership around 21st century learning. Well, I, I can't speak to uh, universities so much, but I can tell you that there's an entrepreneurship program that's been developed for the high school curriculum. And uh, I forget the exact numbers, but there's, there's quite a large number of high schools in Manitoba, or in Winnipeg, I believe, that have signed on to it. And they actually run... Um, a business pitch competition that, that uh, the numbers last year I, were just blew me away when I heard them. It was very successful. So it seems to be that there's a lot of young kids interested in this stuff and uh, um, I know there's been lots of talk and, and the VP uh, research and I have talked about how do you uh, push entrepreneurship training across the university, uh, across all disciplines, not just in the Asper School. Um, and that's something that, that post-secondary institutions in the states, a number of them have, have done quite successfully. James? So uh, actually, actually I, I, I think the idea is actually great, but uh, beyond entrepreneurship, there is actually a mentoring process at the university. Uh, students are actually, a lot of them are very creative. They have, been, they have been having all kinds of good ideas, but they also need uh, some kind of mentors coming in to get them to a certain track so that they can be on the right track to develop their ideas. So, so that's why at the university, that's why a lot of different, different faculties are working together to try to be a, a, a team mentor, something like a team mentor because nobody can be expert of everything. So, so if, if different faculties can, can work together further on and, and, and team mentor students' creative thinking, that would be probably another way, an alternative way of, of answering your question. Okay. Jonathan?
I'm interested in any of the panel members' thoughts on the role of the federal government here. The federal government has a whole spectrum of industrial programs, support programs, innovation programs, productivity programs, and so on. And we've heard for, I'm sure, all of my working life anyway, that in Canada we've got this productivity deficit and we aren't innovative enough and so on and so forth. So none of these are new problems and we haven't solved them at least in the last 30 or 35 years very effectively. So I'm wondering, what is the role, do you think, of the federal government? Should the federal government be choosing industries as winners and industries as losers in Canada? Are there industries where we have an, a competitive advantage on the world stage and we should concentrate on those and not keep beating ourselves up that we aren't competitive in all industries? What's your thoughts? Can I speak to that? Sure, Jerry, start. I really have a strong opinion on that, so I'd just like to get my <laughs> two cents in. Um, I'm not against, I, I'm not in favor of picking winners for all kinds of reasons, but I'll use our company as case in point. We build a product that nobody knows even exists. It's buried in the bowels of the building. It has no curb appeal. If you want to pass out at night rather than a sleeping pill, just read our catalog. <laughs> and, um, and there's no, uh, no wisdom in Ottawa or anywhere that would have singled us out either as being able to be in innovative, to have 20 years ago entered the most fiercely competitive market in the world, which is the U.S., going against established players, deeply capitalized with rich balance sheets, most of which are publicly traded, and we went in and we nailed them. We absolutely nailed them. So I don't believe you can pick winners, and I don't believe sh you should narrow into a certain niches and say those are where you should concentrate the public money. Public money, you should have a program that those who prove that they can win get access to. And whether it's risk capital, I'm not such a fan of because I'm not so sure I want my taxpayers' dollars to any level risked for early venture startup. I think that's for the angel investor and that's for maybe a tiny little pot. But in, top, top, in terms of a solid investment, if you've proven you can innovate, grow your business and penetrate a market, you should have access to capital from your government because it's a good investment. Because I can tell you, if we had an extra X numbers of millions, do you know what we could, well, there's so much we could do and would do, but because we can just rely on what we earn, because you can't borrow to do risk in the in investment, it's only what you earn, we can only grow at a certain pace. So uh, my vote is you don't single out the winners. Who can judge who can run the 100 yard dash in under 10 seconds? Who can judge who's gonna be the best diver, or the best this or that? Amongst all the business, who would have predicted any one of the Googles or anyone, Apple, would have made great hay someday. Back then, the stock value was negligible because nobody thought they were winners. They were passed over. Hindsight tells us they were a winner. Hindsight tells you who the winning companies are, and you should, you should back the winners. That's my vote. Yeah, I, I was just going to, I'm not going to repeat what, uh, what Jerry said, but I 100% agree. Um, Putting money into artificial areas because they, they, they appear to be the winner is, a, is not a good path. And I think the government has shown that failure time and time again. The, the, tri the tri councils now and their approach are basically looking at this and saying, look, we're not going to pick what areas we're going to put these funds into. Those industries that are excited about doing research, you come and make your application. Show us that you can find research capacity in the university and we'll give you the money. And you show us that you're winners. And it's been incredibly successful with that approach. What started off as a program, and, and I'll just use the Engage because it's kind of the, the first date is on us uh, uh, program from the federal government, was, is anytime there's a new relationship between a university researcher and a business, $25,000 goes to the researcher to solve a problem defined by the company. And it started off with a budget of 40 in one year, and in two years they had over 900. And that just shows the incredible hunger in the industrial sector to get that R&D support, to get that going. And then, if they're successful, there are other programs they can access after that. But trying, uh, well, I think the government's probably one of the worst agencies to predetermine what's going to be a winner and what's going to be a loser. Just one more point, uh, adding to what Darren and, and Jim said. Uh, the, the, the money we should pick the industries or winners would be actually the angel investors' money, even not VC's money, because 
VCs are coming in at a later stage of the new ventures, so they actually already, s they have already seen the growth potential. But the angels are the ones who pick the industries because they only know those industries. According to what I, I, I learned from the US market, angel investment market, more than 80% of the investment actually will, uh, will get negative 100% return, which means they will lose every single cent they put in. So they are the ones who pick the industries. Janice, I noticed with interest your comments about Canada being a leader in terms of, of R&D at universities, but we are lagging in business. And I wondered, do universities and colleges and other places do a better job interacting with business, or does business look differently at universities and colleges, other places than they do here? And perhaps, Mr. Price, you could answer that as well. Um, well, I think... Uh, you, uh, Canada does really well at investing in uh, in sort of academic research and, and less well at commercialization, for sure. We're w way down. We're in the bottom quartile on commercialization and the top quartile in our, our research. Um, and so other countries clearly do better on that uh, than we do. Uh, but I'm not sure that was exactly your question. Um, well, I think that's. I think there are a lot of complex answers to that. Um, uh, the, the, I mean, uh, I could maybe add a little yeah, bit on that, yeah. and, and maybe it's just my bias being industrial and being deep into research as a business. Um, I think uh, university research has c come from a history of being curiosity research, not being grounded in commercialization and not being grounded in societal benefit. In other words, uh, the old concept of the ivory tower, and you have the right to pursue your, your, your pet interest, and that the society should fund it, and that's the right. You know, that's kind of the history of where universities have come from. It's a big swing to go from that academic freedom where you have the right to do whatever the heck you want, and that's your God-given right as a university professor, to some level of accountability that there should be some societal benefit or some societal spin-off. So you're changing the mindset of an institution that is collegial, that is uh, steeped in hundreds of years of tradition of being funded by patrons or funded by governments, but not having to account for any kind of economic uh, uh, benefit or societal benefit. We need to rapidly change our university institutions. You need to maintain some level of the traditional ivory tower and curiosity research. I'm not suggesting it be eliminated, but I'm suggesting the pendulum weighs far too much towards the university side and far too little to the industrial need of the nation. And you need to bring that pendulum back and swing it more towards what industry needs. Because what industry needs, it's, it's, comp it's competitive Winnipeg and Manitoba against the world. That's, that's how you gotta look at it. Our city is in a fight for survival, economically speaking, against every other Canadian city and certainly against every US jurisdiction. And, uh, and we're not doing very well at that because we're not a competitive city. Our business is here because I choose to be here. But if I was a pure, raw, emotionless businessman looking at the numbers, we would have long since departed to more fertile, competitive grounds south of the border and would have earned substantially more by moving our business south because the landscape is so much more fertile there. So um, we gotta, I'm, I'm, I don't know how we're gonna work together better, okay. but we need to. I, I'm going to have to respectfully disagree <laughs> with the, your assessment of, uh, of researchers' interests. I would suggest that, that we, the, all universities, and certainly the University of Manitoba, our researchers are absolutely working towards societal benefit, but they are working at the very, very early stage most heavily. And so in a lot of cases, uh, research is simply not making it out into, to see a societal benefit. We're just at that very early stage. And so that balance, I, has, I think, has to change, and that was part of the point I was trying to make is that we have tremendous resource capacity, we have good fundamental research, but if we could take some of that capacity and move it further to the later stage research and development to support those things that can actually roll off a belt, be used on a shop floor to create uh, economic development, I think that would be great. 
But I truly believe researchers' hearts are absolutely looking at societal benefit, and I really think if they open their, their minds to looking at later stage research, balancing their portfolio, they can see how they can create some societal benefits you know, in the shorter term, and at the same time maintain and protect that invaluable early stage research that we are so good at. I could just, uh, I mean, uh, uh, Chris has another person to make an observation at, or ask a question at the top, but just uh, one other observation. I, about a year ago, uh, I can't remember exactly when it was produced, the, uh, the Jenkins Commission that had been, been established to review uh, federal expenditures on, on R&D uh, reported. And um, one of the, the sort of fundamental thrusts in that document to s sort of stand close to where James is uh, was that the universities, in fact, had been doing uh, a pretty good job in Canada uh, with the investments that had been made of public money in research, that, that what we're really lacking was uh, the point that was made earlier, was the receptor capacity and the willingness to be receptors uh, on, on the industrial side. And I think that's one of the conclusions that, uh, that the report came to that has been kind of affirmed by the federal government and, uh, and they're trying to respond to. Um, three points, if I may. Uh, one is uh, kids these days, students these days are lazy and shiftless and don't contribute to, to society. Um, that was Aristotle who said that. Um, and we've heard that time and time again. Second point, I have uh, little to no to negative knowledge on business matters. I say that up front. Um, but I like to think I have some knowledge on education matters. So let me just say this very briefly, so bear with me, that if a business is packing up blueberries and the blueberries come into the plant and those blueberries, some of them are not good blueberries, they should be thrown out of the plant. So there's no comparison to business and education because in education, uh, blueberries being students, if some of them don't work out, we can't throw them out and we have to do something with them. Uh, and the final point is uh, about Canada and the United States. Uh, business aside, uh, money aside, large asides, I grant you, but in every measure that you can imagine, Canada is doing much better than U.S. of A. In life expectancy, in educational attainment, um, teen pregnancy issues, um, uh, mortality. Uh, the only place the states does it very well in my books is they have the largest defense budget and they incarcerate more people than we do. We live very, very well in this country. Thank you. I just want to speak to your second point, which is the point on the blueberries, because uh, I can relate to blueberries. I'm a blueberry pie fan. Um, I, I don't quite agree with you that uh, you need to throw out the blueberries, meaning the kids, if they don't uh, uh, cut it. I think, um, I think you should advise when they don't cut it, and that just means they take a different stream. Uh, our plant is, employs hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Winnipeggers that we've trained into a skill and trade that had we not been here and viable, would be on, these people would be on social assistance and would be a substantial burden to our society. And uh, those are the blueberries that don't make it through certain other channels, they end up in our factories. So uh, if you don't have viable corporations like us that create employment opportunity for every single color of blueberry, which we do, uh, you're in real trouble as a society. That's my point. So I don't care what color the blueberry is or where you land. You need businesses that employ these people at all different levels from low-level jobs in the shop to the highest level software architect in our marketing department. Thank you. So over here, Judy. Um, yes, thank you. I'd like to bring up a little bit of an extension from the last uh, uh, speaker, and that is that there is a su super role for discovery at universities. And I think uh, James Blatt's brought that up. I think that we have to ensure that there still is a large scope for discovery at the university rather than trying to parse out how much discovery we will invest in until we feel we can be innovative because discovery precedes innovation in my view and discovery is in part education and in part just curiosity driven 
interest in any field, not only looking through a microscope or tweaking um, engineering tools to make a better widget. Really, there's discovery every day on this campus, and people are creative. I think that if we write off everybody from square one as not being productive, not being innovative, they think, well, heck, I'm out of here. And we have such a good environment for discovery, but I have to say, we are evaluated all the time. It isn't as if the people trying to do the discovery aren't evaluated and don't persist. So I'd like um, if someone other than Dr. Blatz, because he has already mentioned that he believes in discovery, um, to speak on the, the role of discovery relative to innovation and the track preceding having that idea to make a company or be commercial. That, because we do both discovery and commercialization in our business, so uh, we invest in discovery, paid for by our business, not by the university or public money. So we do our own discovery and we do our own commercialization without a cent of public money or government money funding us. So, so we do both, and I treasure and value both. Uh, both are necessary. Um, don't get me wrong, when I said the uh, the, the old university model in the ivory tower, et cetera. I wasn't suggesting the pendulum swing all the way. I'm just saying bring the pendulum back part way. That's all I'm saying, okay? Sure. I think discovery is essential, and a certain amount of funding is needed for discovery. But I also think commercialization is essential, and a significant funding is needed for that too. That's my point. James and then Jan. Yeah, I was just going to quickly add, and, and I think when I said discovery too, I wasn't I wasn't talking necessarily about, um, well, let me put it this way. I think a better way to look at it is that we do discovery work at a very early stage, and it's, it's really very early in the innovation spectrum. What we should be looking at is trying to get a balance of doing some of the research at the later stage. And what's interesting is, it, and then we see this all the time at the Tri-Councils, the people who are working in that, they, they achieve discoveries at the fundamental stage through applied uh, work at the late stage. It's not mutually exclusive. It's not like it's an either or. All, all that I think that the, the suggestion is, is let's look at a balance of early stage, later stage. Discovery, it flows from all the different stages in the innovation spectrum. So I don't think we have to look at, you know, it's, it's one or the other. I think we need to say, can we look at that balance and then let the, the basic work flow and let the more later stage applied stuff flow as well. Yeah. I, I agree with both Jerry and James. What I would say from my perspective is that the university could um, perhaps invest a little more in working with academics who are interested in working with industry um, and also uh, provide more supports for uh, research that ha for discoveries that exist that have commercial potential um, and, and not necessarily just licensing but also uh, company formation and development and that kind of thing. I think the supports at that level could be really enhanced. I think that's why we uh, <coughs> created James, or that is to say, the job that, <laughs> the job that James is now in. Uh, hi there. I, I just wanted to make a, a quick point that I have a, an issue I'm going to throw out and I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. So first of all, to put some people's fears at ease in this room, it's fascinating to me that everybody keeps going back to uh, students and you know, academic institutions as a place of innovation. It's like the, the go-to thought. Um, Red River College, U of M, both are actively integrating with the startup community here in Winnipeg. Uh, Red River is working on over a dozen startup ideas that didn't come from university, they came from outside the university. So no matter where the idea comes from, um, Jerry mentioned it's you know, Winnipeg versus the world, which is the name, by the way, of our next startup weekend, funny enough. Um, I think that there are students who are learning how to scrape their knees. I think that technology startups like app web apps and things like that offer a low risk way to do that and scale globally, but you can still fail, but you're not gonna fail and lose all of your parents' uh, retirement income, right? So um, I, I see the culture shifting. People are failing and scraping their knees. I think that is changing, maybe not visible yet. But then there's this thing where, okay, what do you do next? And I think there's two big areas there. Number one, angel investment has been talked about a lot. Um, it, for a lot of startups, it's still, it might, might as well be VC, it's so far away. You have to have customers, you have to be out there. Well, that takes, you know, not a lot of money in some people's eyes, but that's a lot of money to some people who are starting the companies up. So I see there being a big hole in 
where, you know, where can people access that, you know, 10 to 50K? And I think mentorship is another big hole in this, in our ecosystem here in Winnipeg. I'd love to some thoughts on how do you engage the private sector, who's maybe not incentivized to do it, to interact and help grow some of these other, because there's lots of research, lots of ideas. What there's not enough of in Winnipeg is execution. And I think a lot of that comes from people not scraping their knees, but people need to be, you know, they need some mentorship too. So it's my thoughts is the risk capital and mentorship. Sure. I, I agree with that completely. I think um, at the very early stage, um, there are the shred credits, uh, the NRC IRAP funding, uh, the commercialization support for business program that, that all support early stage. But at some point, if those really early startups are going to get a little bigger and, and go to market, th they are likely going to need some risk capital, especially if they're in a, a non-asset type sector, an IT sector. So we're working very hard. Um, there, there is uh, an existing angel group. We're, we're looking at uh, organizing other angel groups. Um, that might provide support in that area. We also think absolutely the mentorship issue, and we've heard it uh, loud and clear, the mentorship issue is an important issue. Uh, we have the MIT Venture Mentoring Program uh, that, that we have and ready to launch. We're just searching for the retired or semi-retired entrepreneur who's willing to take that on and become the face of it. We can provide the support and the links, and MIT has been very, uh, uh, supportive, willing to come in and uh, and, and train people, uh, but we, we need to find that champion for it. But we've heard that loud and clear that the mentorship at that early stage is really critical. Uh, I want to share two things. And first of all, let me acknowledge your point. I think it's really important. Nobody has a monopoly on good ideas. And the fact that the college hasn't been mentioned is unf unfair because I, obviously this is happening across the board. Two, two things. The first thing is, uh, I'll tell you our new approach. We are going to be sending out an army of technology managers to get out there into our backyard and find out what's going on in our companies, in our industry, because quite frankly, we just don't have that strong of a connection, not as strong as it can be. And I have been amazed in the past couple of years how many companies I walked to, and, and uh, EH Price is a classic example. They have HVAC uh, research labs that would make mechanical engineers cry. I mean, they're absolutely phenomenal. And the fact is, these things are happening all over the city. And so we need to go out and make those connections. And we need to come back to the labs and to the, to the colleges and say, where are the people that we can connect? The second thing is we have to break down the IP barrier. And this is something the university is exploring very carefully now to start saying, you know what? Let's open up the IP system such that if we have a company that's coming in and we're going to work together, is there an opportunity for us to let them take that IP to market as the experts in that market sector and start to move that forward and then obviously have some return on investment from, from the post-secondary side, but getting rid of all those IP barriers that have really been challenging a lot of that development. So those two things, connections and then letting the industry take things forward. Jen, did you want so to just one more point, adding to uh, what Jan, Jan and James said. Um, Actually, there are two dimensions of mentorship in this case. One is uh, the entrepreneurs need the mentors to lead them to the stage that they can, they can successfully get the financing. That's the part when they try to talk to the angel investors, potentially, or talk to the, uh, the, uh, the uh, VC fund managers. They are able to present their ideas clearly, and, and basically, uh, as what we mentioned before, they are ready to go there, so they need the mentorship there. Another part is the so-called post-investment involvement of those investors. Actually, after they have been financed by, by especially the angel investors and VC, VC funds, they need the mentorship from the investors because those people are the ones uh, uh, who know that industry very well, who are the expert in that industry, also expert in the business model. Okay, last question, or last comment. Okay, I guess I'm... Uh, sorry, I'll try and, um, sorry. A lot of what I was going to say has already been said, which is I was going to say that what it seems to me that we need is more. I was very happy to know that we have something called partnerships now because um, I think there is room for a lot more interaction between the university and the private sector. And I think there is actually a, an appreciation of entrepreneurs, especially like you who have invested in the community and are doing all kinds of very interesting things. I also just wanted to say on the, the dimension of, of where the kids are, um, the sample that I see might be a small one, but I actually am really fascinated by what this next generation is doing because they, they seem to um, be 
have been encouraged to be extremely creative and to jump into all kinds of things. And I expect them to be actually a lot braver about going out and trying things and failing. And I, I, I actually, I mean, the one thing I, about the scraping your knees, I think it's actually good that they can go out and, and scrape their knees. And I think that it's, um, it's a matter of if you go out and you play a game and it's not devastating that you've lost, you will play again, right? And I, I suspect that part of what's happened with the education system is that it's moved more towards that. So I actually think the next generation is going to be much more entrepreneurial than ours was, where if you failed, you were sort of shunted aside and slowly shifted into a much lower category, whereas now you just sort of get right back in and, and you know, play some more. And so I, I actually have more faith in the next generation being entrepreneurial um, than, than ours. Great. Thank you. I'll take one last comment. Gerald. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that. And I guess the first thing I should tell everybody is that uh, I'm the Deputy Minister of Education in Manitoba. So I feel compelled to uh, respond to some of the remarks that have been made. I want to preface three points, though, with two things. First of all, I have a lot of friends, acquaintances, and relatives working in Alberta. And some of them commute there regularly. Some of them have gone to live there. And so I see people moving across the country to where jobs are. The second thing is the education system in Manitoba is not above reproach and it's not above criticism. And we're interested in, in, in improving it all the time. But the three points are is that in our schools, we do try to cre uh, teach creativity. We try to teach create, uh, critical thinking. And we certainly value and we try to teach entrepreneurship. I personally, professionally think that that's a very important thing to be teaching kids, that entrepreneurship is a good attitude to have both in the private sector and the public sector, actually. And that's about being innovative. The second thing is, is that we assess kids all the time. And many kids are struggling and many kids do fail. And what we try to teach them is to be resilient. It may be that we put too much emphasis on self-esteem in the past. It could be that we've gone too far that way. But I think teaching kids to be resilient, you can't do too much of that. The last thing I want to say is, is that the private sector is not the enemy. Definitely not. We want the private sector to be a partner in education. We want to work together. We think we need a strong public sector, a strong public education system, and a strong private sector. These two strong sectors should work together as partners in education. That's how we'll end up with a good society, a place where we'll have prosperous businesses, happy citizens, and a place where we all want to live together. Can I just give a little Thanks, comment Carol. on that before we wrap up? Can I? Very briefly. Very briefly. Um, the uh, Manitoba pool that comes to our company that ultimately become our employees are first class. And we can do a dance around just about any caliber competitor worldwide. So, so the ultimate result of the engineers and uh, accountants and uh, Red River Community College technologists, whomever it is. Uh, Lawyers. Lawyers, yeah. we don't have any, but that's okay. <laughs> um, uh, but we, uh, we are dominating because we're a Manitoba company. 99% of our employees are Manitoba trained and educated, and we have done some good things. So here's a good stroke for Manitoba. So I just want to set that rate. But I want to mention on the Alberta point, we're contemplating closing half a plant in Alberta right now because the, uh, <coughs> we can't find workers who can, who are experienced with using their hands, who can read a tape measure, who can problem solve or even address the most minor critical thinking task on the shop floor. And instead we're opening up in Oregon, we're moving this production line out, constitutes about 50 or 60 jobs. Because in Oregon, uh, like in, in Alberta, these kids are great at uh, their right and left thumb in video games is superb. And technology skills that are that that are electronically focused are fabulous, but put them on the shop floor, a nail, a hammer, anything that recalls any kind of old-fashioned thinking just does not exist. Whereas in Oregon, because it's a hunting and fishing and, and more rural environment, uh, it's phenomenal. Rural environments train and create kids that are fantastic employees. So um, it's sad to say jobs are graduating or moving south of the border because Alberta doesn't have it. Oregon does. I'm, I'm saying that because from an education point of view, you need shops, you need hands-on skills, you mustn't just focus on electronics. Who cares when you learn electronics? Learn them in junior high or high, but make sure you get the fundamentals. That's all I'm... 
It's, it's not. You need these other skills, too. Folks, I'm really conscious of the time. We promised you we'd be done by 8.30. Digger, you have 30 seconds to wind up. <laughs> OK. <laughs> uh, certainly very uh, exciting, <coughs> uh, interesting, and uh, uh, complex issues uh, raised uh, this evening. So summarizing is a challenge, and summarizing is even a challenge in 30 seconds. Uh, so the question which was raised, uh, or the topic was innovation, the key to economic success. It was not raised as a question, but it was, if it was raised as a question, I would say yes, innovation is uh, uh, the key to the economic success, but innovation broadly defined, not innovation treated just as invention, because as uh, was pointed out, innovation can occur at the idea stage, can occur at the product stage, can occur at the marketing stage, can occur at the customer stage. So when you take the innovation broadly defined, it is a key to uh, growth of the economy. Uh, another thing which I think certainly was pointed out was the, the, the innovative products need to be developed. And these innovative products then lead to a high growth economy. And you saw some of the examples of the kind of uh, return which are brought and those returns are not just for the company. Those returns are to the tax revenue of the economy. The employees who are uh, highly paid contribute to the tax, uh, taxes of that particular economy. So there is a certainly a need to, uh, uh, to nurture people who are uh, uh, willing to take risk, have uh, entrepreneurial uh, drive, and are willing to think long term rather than thinking on a short term basis. Uh, one of the speakers uh, had quoted uh, Clayton Christensen. In one of his uh, book, he, and I don't have the quote, so I'm paraphrasing, he talks about that it, uh, if you plant a sapling, it takes many years to grow before you would get, uh, get a shade. So taking that kind of uh, metaphor, what you have to consider is the changing the culture is a slow process. But what we have to take into consideration is with the people like here, the people who are interested in discussing this issue, we have the knowledge, we have the awareness of the issues, we have willingness to make things differently, and maybe that time to change the culture can be shortened and we would have an entrepreneurial, innovative culture in Manitoba. <clears throat> On the 21st of November, we'll be back here with another panel on the topic, the true north, Canada's final frontier, to talk about uh, the economy and culture and uh, sovereignty and various aspects of that important topic. Hope to see you here. Thank you very much for coming, and thank you to the panelists. Thank you.